Come on. And when they're in, they will not depart. Teach them to go to the Lord first. Amen? So they won't go to the junk of the world. I want to welcome all the visitors in the house. Amen. Hope you're enjoying it so far. The presence of God is in this place. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 10. Oh, wow. You can see that we are kind of extending the praise and worship. I mean, when the presence of God is flowing, we don't want to cut that off. Amen? We want to keep that flow going, especially when you got people who are up here pouring their hearts out to the Lord. Amen? I realize, I realize, come on now, I realize that it can get a little long and lengthy, but join on in. Enter in with us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, Luke 10, 17 through 23. Let's start it off with that. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give to you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Interesting, the prophetic words today, amen? And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice. Why, Jesus? Why? Because your names are written in heaven. (laughs) And in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, Son of, uh, who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Bless, Blessed are those eyes which see the, the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. Today I want to talk about a very important topic that is so essential to the Christian life. Seems like I say that all the time. But guess what? Everything I preach is essential, amen? Or else we're just wasting our time, amen? But this one is so essential in the life of a Christian. This dynamic is so important in your Christian walk that without it, there's no doubt that you will spiritually dry up and you will backslide away from the Lord Jesus Christ. The title of my message today is this, The Importance of Revelation. The Importance of Revelation. And really, what I'm talking about is the importance of revelation knowledge. Say revelation knowledge. The word revelation is defined in Webster's as the divine or supernatural disclosure to humans of something relating to human existence or the world. But biblically speaking, here's here's the meaning. It is an uncovering. It's bringing to light that which has previously been wholly hidden or, or only obscurely seen of truth from the word of God. I like that. It's an uncovering. Say uncovering. The word of God says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, he says that the letter kills, but the spirit, the Holy Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit, here's what I'm talking about, about the importance of revelation. The Holy Spirit gives life to the word of God in our spirit. We need the anointing to flow in our lives to to bring more understanding and to take us deeper in the word. Amen? Amen. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is the author of the word? You know, what, what a privilege it is that we have access not only to the word, but to the one that wrote it. See, God used men and women of God to, to write his words on the pages of this book. But the author is the Holy Spirit. you got to understand that. Amen? So Jesus said, I love it. He said, it's good. He told his disciples, he said, it's good that I go away. Because when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit that can be with every member of my body on this earth. And guess what? He's saying this. He's saying the Holy Spirit, his, uh, his relationship 
is going to be as if I was in the flesh with you on this earth. See, Jesus didn't leave his body helpless. Come on, somebody. Go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'm talking about the importance of revelation in the life of a Christian. Let's go deeper into deeper waters with this topic. Matthew 16, and let's look at uh, verses 13 through 19 here. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? Uh, the, son of, uh, the son of man, who I the son of man am. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so they said, some say, uh, the, the, John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? See, we're all asked that same question. Who do you say that I am? Amen? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you uh, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. Man, I like that then it gets real interesting. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. See, Peter had a revelation that very moment that Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And I'm so thankful that, that Jesus revealed that flesh and blood was not the reason that Peter understood this, amen? Amen. It had nothing to do with his smarts. It had nothing to do with his natural brain. He said his father in heaven uncovered, pulled back the veil, and revealed this truth to him. See, when we talk about revelation knowledge, it has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with how many degrees you have or, or anything like that. Revelation knowledge is received in your spirit, man. Now, let me just, let me cover this again. We are a spirit being. You know that? Okay? You're not, you're not just a human being. You're first and foremost a spirit being. You possess a soul, mind, will, and emotions, and you live in a physical body. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's not to your brain. It's to your spirit, man. We got to train up our spirit man to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Revelation knowledge is received in your spirit. And then it's sorted out by your soul, mind, will, and emotions. Chew on that one for a while. That's a pretty deep subject there. But Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. The rock that Jesus was talking about is not, is not Peter, as the, you know, Catholicism teaches. It's not, he's not talking about Peter, Okay. Yes, I just said that, by the way, okay? Hello, somebody. It's not talking, the rock is this, is that knowing, the revelation of knowing that Jesus is the Christ. Re say revelation. revelation. That's the rock that he's going to build it on. Amen? He's talking about revelation knowledge of knowing he's the Christ. Not just head knowledge, but revelation knowledge that truly impacts a person. That revelation impacts every part of the Christian's life. When a revelation comes of who Jesus really is, come on, somebody. You won't be voting for someone who's for abortion. You won't be voting. Oh, come on, somebody. Are you following me right now? It causes a Christian to boldly stand up for Jesus Christ and the Word of God no matter the cost. Amen. That's what revelation will do. When that revelation pops in your spirit, man, nobody can talk you out of it. You ever have that? You get a revelation of a topic in the Word of God, and then someone com comes along and they try to, oh, you know, I, I don't believe that, and they try to talk you out of it, and you're like, <laughs> it's too late, the revelation came. Are you following me? Amen. Like when someone tries to come to me and say, well, healing's not for today. I'm saying, you know what? You're 23 years too late. 
The revelation's been received. I've seen too many miracles. I've seen too many signs and wonders. I've seen too many things. Sorry, you're not going to talk me out of this, devil. Come on, somebody. But, you know, have you ever known someone, they call themselves a Christian, but there's no evidence to support it? You want to know why? Because one of two things are happening in that person's life. Number one, they have never had a solid revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. Come on. Or, or they have failed to keep the revelation fresh on the inside. And they let the, the thorns of this world choke out the word in their life. They've fallen away, what the Bible says. They've fallen away from their first love. They have allowed their spiritual life to totally get choked out. They allowed their spiritual fire to get put out. Have you ever heard someone who, who just recently got saved and they are on fire? I mean, it's like a night and day difference. And then a mature Christian comes along and says, you need to tone it down a little bit. You ever heard someone say that? Mm -mm. Let the fire burn. Let it burn hot. That is how Jesus wants us to keep it. Are you following me? That's how he wants us to keep it going. He doesn't need, never wants that fire to go out. Say, I'm going to keep my fire burning. But I'll go deeper in that in a moment. But let me finish Matthew 16. Satan and the kingdom of darkness absolutely hate when a Christian receives revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? He absolutely hates it because it creates that boldness, that faith on the inside, that here, it will take them from being in a defensive position, oh, please, enemy, don't hurt me, to an offensive position and push them out of a place. How are we supposed to advance the kingdom of God without moving forward? We got to move forward, amen? We have to be on the offensive against them. Jesus said, that he would give us the keys to the key of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen? Amen? I want you to notice this, that nothing happens in heaven before something first happens on earth. Oh, see, if more Christians would take that principle and understand it, they will stop blaming God for the problems in their life. God, why are you doing this to me? God's saying, I've given you everything you need. Now use it. Amen. Jesus is telling us he gave us the keys uh, of his authority to the church, to the body of Christ. And, but I found something out. If someone were going to give you a car and they throw the keys at you, you know what? You have a car, but until you put the keys in the ignition, start it up and drive, it does you absolutely no good. And the same thing is true with the authority that we have in Jesus Christ. You notice the prophetic words that came forth this morning? I think the Holy Ghost is really trying to tell us something this morning. Amen? Don't just accept what the enemy is doing. Amen? Amen. The primary way to bind and loose, I said the primary, is by our spoken words because both kingdoms, I say it all the time, but I see visitors, but the kingdom of, of Satan and the kingdom of God, both kingdoms are voice activated. The words are powerful. Words, and I just preached about the power of our words, didn't I? So go to livingwaterschapel.org and you can listen to the sermons. But I always like to bring it up because how, you can't talk about this enough because it affects people's lives. Amen? So it's interesting that Jesus did, did say that, you know, Something first has to happen on earth before it moves in heaven. Now, here's a point that the Holy Spirit wanted me to bring up to you. It's a very intriguing topic. But many times, angels and ministering spirits of God that help us on earth, they reside in the presence or glory of God in heaven, and they are sent to earth to help us. Uh, now, this is a, the, the whole angelic uh, teaching from the Word of God. It's It's... It's an amazing thing. Amen? We need to know we have heavenly help. Amen? And this is why, let me go a little deeper on this one, that anybody that has ever had an angelic encounter, they sense and feel the manifest presence or the glory of God when they have an angelic encounter. Why? Because they come from the presence of God in heaven down to earth. They carry the glory. They carry the presence of God on their life. One example, a proof of that, is Luke 1, verse 19. 
Ga- the angel Gabriel, when he went to tell Zacharias, hey, Elizabeth's going to have John the Baptist, right? This is what Gabriel said. He said, I am Gabriel who stands, here it is, in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you to bring you glad tidings. Amen. How about Jacob's ladder? Remember Jacob? He had that that dream, that vision of a ladder from earth to heaven, and he's seen angels coming and going, coming and going. It's powerful. I'll talk about another example here in a minute, but go with me to Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18. So many people are paranoid to talk about angels, like, oh, you're going to bring glory to them. No, we're talking about things that pertain to the kingdom of God. We don't worship angels, but you better know... (laughs) that you don't want to hinder them from working. I, I don't know about you, but I want to learn how to cooperate with everything in the kingdom of God. Amen? We need to know how to operate and cooperate with what God is doing, and he's happened to use his angels. Amen? So Proverbs 29, 18. See, the, the devil always loves to take topics away like that and say you're bringing glory to this and this. Anytime the devil's saying that, you know he's trying to take you away because it's a powerful topic that he has, doesn't want you to have any knowledge about. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no revelation, some, some uh, versions say vision. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. The word translated revelation in this verse, do you want to know what it really means? It means this, prophetic vision. Pro, this is deep. Prophetic vision. Where there is no prophetic vision from the Holy Spirit, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law or the word of God who is a doer of the word of God. So this is the importance of revelation. When a person loses prophetic spiritual vision, they begin to backslide in their walk with God. I guarantee you, you find any person who was on fire in, in the past, they're on fire for the Lord in their personal life, right? And now they're backslidden. I guarantee you, they lost spiritual vision. They lost hope because they allowed something else, here it is, to take their focus off of the Lord. Prophetic vision, here it is. Prophetic vision looks forward. It gets a glimpse of what's ahead of you and reveals, come on, the consequences of actions and spoken words. Many times, here we go, the Holy Spirit, maybe you guys have had this too, Many times, the Holy Spirit will give you a picture on the inside, a vision of what is to come in your life. I know it happened to me. When I first got born again, I had a flash of something. In that vision, I'm telling you, it's still as fresh as it was 23 years ago when I got born again. It's a vision that the Holy Spirit gave me of something that's going to come into the future, and it keeps coming up, and it keeps me moving forward. Prophetic vision. Say prophetic vision. If you will hold on to that picture on the inside, it will motivate you to run your course and to stay on track with the Lord. When that vision is lost, listen, you only think about the now and whatever feels good to your flesh instead of keeping your eyes on the prize. Say, I got to keep my eyes on the prize. Don't let the enemy get your eyes off the prize. Don't let them do it. Don't fall into that pit, to that trap. Amen? Amen. The per, uh, that person becomes a, what the Bible calls a carnal Christian. They lose sight of the importance of their daily spiritual walk with the Lord. And we can't do that. Now, I want you to notice it says in verse 18, the last part, it says, happy is he or she who keeps the law. That verse is literally saying that we can only maintain a life of revelation, prophetic spiritual vision when we keep the word of God fresh in our heart. The moment you stop the flow of the word of God coming into your ear gate and coming into your eye gate, that, the moment you stop filling your heart with the word of God, that's when you cut off your spiritual prophetic vision or revelation. 
and you will begin to backslide in your Christian walk. You will begin to get spiritually dry and your, your heart will get poisoned with the junk and the distractions of this evil world system. It just will. See, here's the thing. Here, let me just tell you something. On, on this sinful earth, when we do nothing, the enemy and the flesh win by default. The enemy and the flesh win by default. You actually have to do something to prevent that from happening in your personal walk with God. That's why I had preached a message before, on purpose Christianity. You don't, you don't walk the Christian walk by accident. You live it on purpose for God. Amen? You have to push some things away out of your life, some these worldly things that are taking the, the, you know, your fire away from the Lord. You've got to push these things away and get into the Word. The enemy hates the prophetic. I don't know if anybody, all my, all my prophetic people, come on, I know, you know this. The, the enemy hates the prophetic anointing. He hates it. The prophetic ministry is so powerful because it exposes the enemy. It, it, the prophetic anointing, the, that's where the Lord, the, the Holy Spirit will give you insight of what's going on, and the Holy Spirit gives you a strategy to come against it. Amen? Oh, he hates the prophetic ministry. Man. See, here's why. The prophetic anointing combines this. These are the two things wa uh, that the prophetic ministry has that the enemy hates. You ready for this? Write them down. It combines spiritual vision with discernment. Spiritual vision with discernment. How many of you know we are living on earth right now? We better have discernment. Because some things that are good are not God. Some things, some things might not be bad, but they're not God, and they can turn into a distraction. Amen? Amen? See, the enemy wants you to be spiritually blind against him. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Oh, I'm feeling the river flowing now. Hallelujah. Psalm 119. The enemy does not want you guys to hear this message, trust me. Psalm 119, and I'm proud to deliver it. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 11. It says this. It's a popular passage. It says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's the deal. We must continually fill or hide the word of God in our heart and keep the word of God fresh in our heart. What, the, what does that mean? Fresh in our thought life. Say, I got to keep my thought life filled. That's right. That's right. See, hiding in the word of God in your heart keeps your spiritual eyes open. It keeps the, provision, uh, the prophetic vision flowing in your life. It will keep our discernment against the enemy very sharp. Amen? See, here's the deal. I, I'm a pilot. I have my pilot's license, so I like using some of these things. This is, what, this is just how the Holy Spirit shows me things. But keeping the word of God in our heart is kind of like a landing gear warning system. When I'd come in for landing, um, if you're below a certain airspeed, a horn will go off if the landing gear is not down. It's saying, beep, beep, beep. It's warning you. It's saying, because the plane thinks it's coming in for a landing, but your landing gear is not down. It's warning you. And when you keep the word of God hidden in your heart, that warning system is active. That's when you come up against something in your life. That's when, when so, the enemy's trying to do something in your life. That's when you hear the beep, beep, beep. And the Holy Spirit brings a scripture to your remembrance. It keeps your discernment sharp. Are you following me? Yes. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I love the warning systems of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but it saved me from a lot of heartache in the past. But you know, it's also brought heartache when I ignored the warning system in my life. You ever been? Oh, come on. I know I'm preaching to living people this morning. Amen? We've all been there. Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 22 here. Therefore also, therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. 
And I'm glad that the Holy Spirit through Paul told what the prayers were. Here we go. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit, underline it, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what, is, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Ooh, so there's, some, uh, there's our responsibility, those who believe. That's where the, our power, we, that's how we tap into it. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet. Isn't that good to know? And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who, fi who fills all in all. The apostle Paul was praying for the Christians in Ephesus here. I want you to notice that, oh, we're gonna, here, you gotta take hold of this. This is powerful. He was praying for the Christians at Ephesus and I want you to notice that he prayed that his heavenly father would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. See, here's the deal. The first thing we need to pull out of this passage is this. It is 100% scriptural to pray for more revelation in your life. Amen. Amen? Also, we know from the book of James that our heavenly father invites us to pray for wisdom. Remember that? He says, pray for wisdom, and I'll give it liberally. See, our Heavenly Father is a liberal giver. Amen? The Apostle Paul prayed for both wisdom and revelation together. Here's what you need to know. Wisdom and revelation are twins. We need both active in our life to be effective disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need wisdom to know how to apply revelation to our life in a practical sense. And we need revelation knowledge to give us faith and boldness to walk in that wisdom. There's a reason. Listen, this is what's so powerful about this. No words are wasted in the word of God. No words. When he says it, there's a reason behind it. Amen? So revelation adds power to the wisdom. So pray for both wisdom and revelation in your life together. All right, Wiz, add it. just go ahead, add it to your daily prayer list. In fact, put a little note card up and stick it to the bathroom mirror every morning and pray for it. And I guarantee you, you'll have more revelation of the word of God in your life. It'll just start flowing like a waterfall. Hallelujah. Mm, I'm telling you, invite the Holy Spirit. Then Paul prayed this that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. Did you know, just like you have eyes in the natural, you have spiritual eyes. Amen. In fact, for every sense in the natural, the five senses, you have five spiritual senses. And I, that's a whole other topic, which I'm going to preach on eventually because it's powerful. But he prayed for the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. Why? So they would know the hope of God's calling on their life personally. Here we go. Here's the next importance of revelation. We see here that revelation releases and reveals purpose in a person's life personally. If you were to interview any Christian right now struggling with, with really bad depression, not all of them, but the majority would say this. It would come down to this. And I've counseled many people who had very bad depression, and it always came to this. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my purpose is on this life. And that creates a vacuum. That, because the, every person on the face of this earth has a purpose. You do know that, right? So if, it's, if someone's not walking into their purpose, it doesn't mean that God does not have a purpose. It means they have not tapped into it yet for one reason or the other. Amen? Amen. So revelation reveals purpose, which ignites passion for life. No passion, no purpose. 
And that's how the enemy keeps Christians in bondage. Amen? Amen. So this prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians, pray it for yourself. Pray it for family members. Pray it for your loved ones. Because it's an anointed prayer. Pray the word. I love that phrase. Pray the word. Because this is an anointed prayer from the Holy Spirit. So put your name into it. Amen? So someone recently, I'm not going to say any names, but just I want to use it as an example. Someone recently, um, I gave someone a word about a gate opening, a big gate opening, right? And uh, for when, when that gate opens to walk through it, right? And, and this person was like, you know, kind of nervous about how do I know when it's going to open, right? How do I know? They're just kind of like, you know, I, I don't want to miss it. And immediately the Holy Spirit dropped this revelation, this word to answer that question. Are you ready for this? And this is for everybody. This is for you watching online right now around the world even. Ready? He said, you will not miss it because you're looking for it. You will not miss it because you're expecting it to come. You be looking for it and expecting. You will not miss what God's going to do. Listen, the Holy Ghost is big enough to get our attention. Amen? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Someone else, someone needed to hear that today. So you will know when the Holy Spirit's, oh, I just, whoa, I just felt the anointing hit me like a wave up here. Woo. So be spiritually alert. Be spiritually alert and expecting God to move when you pray. Amen? Remember, nothing happens in heaven before something happens on earth first. Amen? Give the invitation and watch the Holy Spirit move. Now, I want you to notice something very interesting about this passage. The fact that the Apostle Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to pray for supernatural wisdom and and, and revelation to the Ephesians, right? Right? He was praying for it, reveals this fact to us, that if it doesn't happen, that it doesn't automatically happen in our life. Let me say it again. Come on, don't miss it. If we don't pray for it, this thing does not automatically happen. So if Paul, the apostle Paul's praying for someone to receive, we need to do the same thing. Amen? Amen? Anywhere, in fact, anywhere, when you're reading in the Word where someone was praying for something, interesting. Remember, this is the Word of God. When they're praying for something, that thing's not going to happen unless you pray first. In fact, the Lord said this, pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest to the lost. Well, isn't it God's will for people to be saved? Of course it is. But why then would Jesus tell us to pray for laborers? He's inferring if we don't pray for laborers, it's not going to happen. Think about it. Something might be the will. Listen, something might be, okay, let's, oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. It's God's will that everyone be saved. Are there people in hell right now for eternity? Absolutely. Just because something is the will of God doesn't mean it's going to happen you got to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Someone need to hear that this morning. So, here's the deal. How about this? Daniel. Daniel received a vision, and he prayed and fasted for how many days? Remember this? 21 days for the meaning of it to come. For revelation. He was seeking revelation. This is in Daniel chapter 10. And when the angel finally broke through the resistance, remember this account? It said that an evil principality withstood him for 21 days. But the angel told Daniel, he said, I was dispatched from heaven the first day you prayed. How many people give up on praying so quick? They think God's not going to answer my prayer when really there's a struggle going on in the heavenlies for that answer to come. Come on, I hope this builds hope on, on the inside of you, all of you. See, when Daniel wouldn't give, what, what would happen if Daniel gave up on the 20th day? It would have never have come to him. The revelation would not have been delivered. Here's what the Holy Spirit told me. Write this down. This is this. When I wrote this down, I about fell out of my seat. It was so powerful. This is what he said. He said, angelic persistence depends on your prayers. 
Oh, my goodness. Angelic persistence, fighting in the heavenlies, depends on your prayers. That's powerful. I about fell out of my seat. You see, what happens is, when you really start to dig into the word, when, you, when the Holy Spirit starts to give you revelation, you know what happens? The heaviness, the, the, the weightiness of how much depends upon us as Christians and not on God. With what happens on this earth depends on our prayers, our actions on this earth. Amen? Amen. See, the word says that we are to be doers of the word. We're the doers. When we start doing the word, the Holy Spirit helps us do the word. If we're not doing it, Holy Spirit has nothing to help with. It just, it just, that's the revelation that you get. When you start to really press in into the word of God, that's what you get. Now, now here's what happens. Those that are caught up in, in kind of a dead religion, just the letter, the letter, without the spirit, everything is God's fault. Are you hearing me? Everything's God's fault. God, why didn't you do this? And they start to get angry and bitter at him. That's why we need revelation knowledge from the Holy Ghost. That's why we need a freshness. He makes the word of God fresh. He shows us how to apply the word in our life. Amen? So we need to pray that our Heavenly Father would reveal the riches of what we have in Christ, all the amazing benefits. Amen? Not only for our life, but pray for others as well. Now, um, so I want you to notice in Paul's prayer, he prayed that the Christians would know their authority in Christ. Not just know it, but use it. Use it. Say, I got to use it or I'm going to lose it. You might lose some battles because you don't use your authority. Are you following me? See, here's what people don't understand. The ultimate victory has been won. We understand. But there's many battles. All right? I don't know about you. I want to win every battle that comes against me in, in, against from the enemy. Amen? Let me give you one last example of, of, of the enemy hating and trying to hinder revelation. And this, uh, here we go. This is a powerful example. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Oh, yes. Pastor James is going to tackle Paul's thorn in the flesh. Let's talk about this, because I think this has been sorely misunderstood by many. They have dead religion. <laughs> Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10. Let me help give some understanding here of what's going on. See, a lot of times, if we would just read the word, it's all in the book, right? But here's the deal. We need the Holy Spirit glasses to pull it out. That's why you can have people read the word and still be blinded to the truth that's in the word. You've got to be open to the author, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Here it is, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above, the measure, uh, above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The first thing we need to know about this thorn in the flesh, it was not a sickness or disease. See, many sincere Christians want to say that's what it was, but they're sincerely wrong. Are you following me? The enemy, this is how the enemy uses a teaching like that to keep Christians in bondage. It says here, here it is. Let's get to the roots of it. It says that lest he should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to him 
a messenger of Satan to buffet him. The messenger of Satan, a demon spirit, was not sent by God. It was sent by the enemy. It was sent by the enemy to stir up persecution everywhere Paul went to minister. It was persecution and not a sickness or disease. God was, God was the one, listen to this. Let's just really think about this. And I'm going to bring it down to your level here in a moment. God was the one giving these revelations and amazing spiritual experiences to Paul, wasn't he? Right? God gave it to him. God was not punishing Paul with what God was doing in his life. That's like you or I as a parent setting a sucker out for our little child and say, if you touch that, I'm going to beat you. God is not a child abuser. Are you following me? Paul was a very humble man after getting born again. So it wasn't an issue of humility. Again, this was, it says it right in the book, a messenger of Satan, not God. And I don't know if you know this, but God and Satan are not partners in crime. If, if we open, if we are the ones that open ourselves up to the enemy. Can you imagine can you imagine if, that, if God and Satan were, were partners? You would never be able to trust your heavenly father. I, I wouldn't be able to, would you? Come on, somebody. The enemy, here's what happened. The enemy hated the fact that Paul was receiving so much revelation. And not just that, but here's what happened. He was passing the revelation on and teaching it to other Christians. And the enemy was trying to stop him from doing that. He was trying to make Paul's life miserable. He was trying to get Paul to throw in the towel and quit. Paul said, lest he be exalted above measure. That's not talking about pride. Here's what it's talking about. He's talking about this, above measure. He's saying, staying at the ground level, just the normal, just the normal just doing what it takes to make it to heaven. Are you following me? Amen. That lest he should be exalted above measure. I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of times when the word talks about revelation from the Holy Spirit, it's no accident. It's talking about going higher. The Holy Spirit, Paul was saying, these revelations were coming to me and it was, it was making me stronger as a believer. And not just that, but he's teaching it to other Christians. I'm telling you, that will stir up a hornet's nest against the enemy. Are you following me? So just remember that. Anytime you see talk about revelation, it's talking about going higher in the Lord. All right? So the enemy was trying to pull Paul back down by using persecution. He's trying to break his focus. This sound familiar when you got an attack by the enemy? where the enemy has been using you in a powerful way, revelation come, and all of a sudden it feels like a Mack truck hit you in life. The enemy saw you were going higher above the normal plane, and he's trying to knock you back down. That is the thorn in the flesh right there. Paul said that, here's the deal, let's talk about these issues that people talk about. Paul said that he pleaded with the Lord three times, that this evil spirit would be, depart from his presence, all right? And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient and made perfect in weakness. The Lord, here it is, the Lord didn't do anything about it because of this reason. You ready for this? Because we as Christians are never promised to be delivered from persecution for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in fact, Jesus said it's a promise. He said, if you're gonna preach the gospel and live for me, you will be persecuted. So that's why, so it wasn't a sickness and disease because we know it wasn't that because the word of God is full of promises of healing. God's word's full of promises of healing and provision for healing, amen? If it was a sickness or disease, the word of God would be contradicting itself and you wouldn't be able to trust anything in this, in this book. God never contradicts himself. The word of God never contradicts itself. That's why it says that we need to rightfully divide the word. 
So when someone comes along and says it's a sickness or disease, they're not rightfully dividing the word. They're not taking into account that much of this book talks about healing, talks about deliverance, setting people free. Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen. We need to stay in line with the word of God. The Lord was telling Paul to keep doing what he's doing, and his grace is sufficient with the call on his life in connection to persecution. Amen? Now, here's another one that people like to use. Well, doesn't it say infirmities in there, right? Isn't that sickness or disease? Let's slay that sacred cow right now. The word infirmities in that passage is not talking about sickness or disease. The literal meaning of that word, infirmities, is this, our inability to produce results. Our inability to produce results results has nothing to do with sickness, disease, or infirmity. So drop the lie right now. Satan, you've been exposed. Come on, somebody. See, there's going to be some things that happen in your life when you're preaching the gospel. If, if, if there could be some persecution coming your way, right? And sometimes that's a price we pay for being a Christian, right? In an evil world. There's going to be some people who don't like you right? I know you, you guys are all great people, right? So am I. I'm a great guy. I'm, a, I'm, I'm probably the funnest person you'll ever hang out with. <laughs> See, now here's the problem. People judge me when on uh, my boldness and coming against things. They think, man, he can't be that fun to hang around. Baloney. I'm the, I ha in fact, my sense of humor is huge, all right? So, but, but I take the word of God very seriously, and we need to, especially when we're up here at the pulpit. Amen? So God wants you to go higher spiritually with more revelation, and the devil is terrified of you receiving more revelation of it. Don't let him stop you. See, the, when the Holy Spirit gives you a revelation of something, he's expecting you to run with it. Don't just sit there with the football. Run with it. Say, I'm going to run with it. And after receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit, um, It'll take you above the normal plane. I don't want to be normal. Do you want to be normal? No way. I don't want to be limited to earthly wisdom. I don't want to be limited to worldly things in the natural realm. I want to take full advantage of every benefit that Jesus Christ died to give us. Amen? Man, we have some great things that we have yet to tap, tap into. We need to tap into the power, anointing the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is a message that Satan doesn't want you to hear today. One last thing I want to point out, and I'm done and we're out of here, is that the Apostle Paul's life, one thing pointing out about his life in ministry in connection to receiving revelation knowledge would you like to know that that point is that kind of an interest to you because the apostle paul was quite amazing i mean he walked in miracle signs and wonders he did some amazing things for the lord jesus christ amen paul said in first corinthians 14 18 he said something very interesting that gives us a key of where this revelation came from he said i thank my god i speak in tongues more than you all. The Holy Spirit said this to me. He said if Paul wouldn't have willfully on his own will spoken tongues as much as he did, he wouldn't have received as much revelation. Now, does that blow you away or what? The enemy hated Paul for receiving revelation because it took him higher spiritually and, and he passed it on to others. But it all started with the Apostle Paul yielding to the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say, speaking in tongues. I'm, I said it last week, and, and I said it many times, but I'll say it again. Every breakthrough in my life, every powerful revelation, every powerful experience, I first increased my time of praying in tongues before it happened. That's how powerful it is because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to pray the perfect will of God through you. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Look at it, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Whew. I'm telling you, I'm just giving you a little hint right here. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. It says, for he who speaks in a tongue 
does not speak to men but to God, for no man understands him. However, in the, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. It's those mysteries that become a revelation to you in your spirit. That's what happens. Man, I feel the anointing on this. When you're speaking, in fact, the, the word of God even goes on to say, pray that you would interpret. See, it's not, the interpretation, a lot of times we just think of it as the gift of tongues. When, you know, like when Sister Bonnie gets up and she gives a, um, you know, a tongue and then someone else interprets. interprets. It's, that's not all it's talking about. It's saying whenever you speak in tongues, stop for a moment. And say, Lord, I pray you'd give me the interpretation of what I just prayed. You know something? I'll tell you this. When I'm here during the week, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised there's still carpet down here because I walked this, <laughs> this sanctuary for him. When I pray in tongues here, I pray un t in tongues until I feel the inspiration. And I, and I say, Lord, give me the interpretation of my tongues. And until I don't pray in English until I have inspiration after praying in tongues for quite a while. Because my natural mind's finite. I don't know what to pray for. I don't know everything that's going on in the spirit realm against me, against all you, against, right? I could be praying in here. I could be praying for Brother Barry, and I don't even know it. I'm just praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting here, and I'm, I'm walking around praying, and all of a sudden, I'll get a vision of one of you from the church, and I'll just start praying in English about it. The Holy Spirit is revealing. He's showing mysteries in the Spirit. And there be, here, don't ever forget this. Mysteries become the revelation that the Holy Spirit shows you. So if you want more revelation, pray in tongues more. Up your game. More revelation will bring more manifestation of the benefits of the gospel in your life. And I said it before, I love this phrase. More revelation, more manifestation. So come on, church, let's pray in tongues. Pray in your known language. Pray in tongues. Press in. Ask God for more revelation. Ask him for it. Amen? Church, let's keep the spiritual fire burning. Let's stand up in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost on that. See, I was, I was actually considering keeping off that last point. Because I was just in the message kind of talking about the importance of it. But the Holy said, no, 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 no. Put in that point. Because I've, I'm probably eventually going to preach on how to receive more with more points the Holy Spirit showed me. But the Holy Spirit wanted me to add that point in today. So take it and use it. So maybe there's someone in this place you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. Don't leave this place without making him Lord of your life. You don't know when you're going to take your last breath. Well, that's faithless, Pastor James. No, it's not. It's wisdom. You don't know. You don't know. So if you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, meet me up at this altar at the end of service, and I want to pray with you to have a new birthday, the new birth, born again. Amen? Amen. Maybe there's someone in here. You, you know, maybe you were one I was talking about. You lost your fire. You lost your spiritual vision. You feel dry spiritually. Frankly, if you drop dead right now, you have no idea. God, would I go to heaven? I don't know. Your relationship with him has just really failed and struggled in life. If that's you, I want you to come up after service, and I want to pray with you. Let's rededicate your life to the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. There, there should be no question mark on your salvation. If there's a question mark in your mind, in your heart, you need to come and, and get prayer this morning. Let's just settle it today. Amen? Amen? Maybe you've never received the Holy Spirit baptism. Maybe someone in here, you hear me talk about praying in tongues, and you've never received the Holy Spirit baptism. Or you have, but you've never spoken tongues. Come on up. Let's pray. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. To, for what? To be a showboat? No, 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 no. To be a powerful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We need power out in this world. I'll tell you that right now. Now, maybe you need prayer for healing, physical, emotional. You have prayer for anything, a loved one, anything else. I just want to let you know, I am going to be up here, and I want to pray with you. Now, um, if any visitors here, thank you so much for being here. There's a visitor's card right in front of you, should be. 
uh, fill it out, just drop it in the suggestion box and back, um, or leave it at the seat and we'll just pick it up later. But, um, oh, the 12 ministry teams in back. Anybody want to get involved with what we're doing here at Living Waters? We're getting ready to take the next step and activate those things. Amen? So if you want to jump on board, you want to ride the wave with what God is doing here at Living Waters Chapel, stop back there. There's a list of, of the 12 ministry teams and, uh, and what you know, would be expected. And uh, sign up. We're going to have a great old time. If you need me, you know where to find me. Amen? Grab my card. I want to meet with you. If you want to talk, counseling, deliverance ministry, whatever it is, I'm always available for you guys. All right? Guys, I love you. Thank you so much. Have a blessed week. Tuesday prayer call, Wednesday prayer, get out of here. All right. Love you guys.